You're listening to the Quints podcast. Welcome to season 2 of the Quints Fortnightly podcast Land of a Billion. We aim to bring you expert conversations about the most contentious of the holy roti kapda makan trinity that is the makan over our heads and the larger ecosystem that governs it. This podcast is produced in association with the Property Rights Research Consortium supported by Omidya Network India. I'm Bhargavi, a researcher interested in land and access to finance and your host for this season. Today we are going to talk about something that's close to all our hearts, namely fighting. Okay, kidding. So, a 2014 research study shows that about 25% of India's 700 odd districts are actually affected by land and property related disputes. It's not just 2014. Pick any year, the trend is likely to be the same. A 2017 Research study by Daksh shows that at least 30% of the civil cases in India's courts involve land and property related disputes. Many of them are relating to land acquisition, and this presents a very strange paradox because actually the confidence that people have in India's courts is really low. You ask somebody, would you litigate over property? Would you litigate with your family members? And most people will perhaps tell you that no, maybe not. Why? Because courts are slow. We don't get a date very soon. Judges are missing. Litigation is expensive. But then, why are people still fighting over land? It either means that courts are very fast when it comes to land acquisition-related disputes, or it could mean that the law is so fundamentally broken. that there is no choice left fortunately for us today we have with us lia vargis who has been studying land acquisition related disputes for a long time now lia is a lawyer and a social scientist with a wide ranging work experience in corporations non-profits and political campaigns across india She's a graduate of Columbia University and the National Law School of India University. She frequently writes on judicial reform and access to justice in India and currently she's a research manager at Daksh, a civil society organization based in Bangalore. Hi Lia, welcome to this podcast. Hi, a uh, pleasure to be here. So Lia, like I said, you know, what is this paradox where people don't believe in courts but people are still clearly litigating a lot over land acquisition? Why has the process of land acquisition been so heavily contested in India? Uh, so I think the first thing we need to remember is the process of land acquisition is an expropriatory process. So it is compulsory acquisition of land, and you know most people have uh, some kind of an emotional attachment to their land. So if you are compulsorily acquiring their land, they are not going to be very happy about it. Um, Additionally, the legal regime surrounding land acquisition, which uh, before 2013 was under the Land Acquisition Act 1894, uh, had a lot of loopholes, left a lot of uh, uh, scope for executive discretion, and this just uh, led to a burgeoning of uh, litigation. And as you had pointed out, in India, litigation is not easy. I mean, it takes time. Uh, you have to pay a lawyer throughout, but still, people are choosing to litigate over land acquisition. So uh, it. it shows that you know the executive process involved in land acquisition is in a sense broken and uh, what we need to remember is um, a lot of the litigation is over compensation so it's difficult to actually challenge the acquisition itself so what most people do is is uh, Uh, fight over the compensation, and in a lot of cases, uh, I mean, we our study covered uh, Maharashtra and Karnataka, and we found that uh, at least at the high court level, more than a half, more than half of the litigation was over compensation, and um, uh, in a lot of cases, the courts were actually enhancing compensation. So this shows that at the level of the collector, the compensation wasn't computed properly. And uh, once people see that that you know courts are enhancing comp- uh, compensation, it's an incentive to litigate. So you know uh, it becomes a kind of a cycle. So if a um, thousand people's land is being acquired and one person goes to court and you see that you know uh, their uh, compensation has been increased, you think why not? 
I mean, no loss because you're not going to get your land back, but maybe you'll get more money out of it. Wow, that's fantastic. So that makes me wonder, I mean, when you say that in a lot of cases, the court actually ends up enhancing the compensation, the difference between what the collector determined and what the court awards must have been so big that people actually find it worth it to litigate, right? Which is that even if you take into account the time that goes into court, the lawyer's fees, and also the the sheer mental pressure, right? Uh, people still find it worth litigating for something like land acquisition, which either suggests that the collector was determining compensation consistently at an extremely low level, or that courts have been extra generous in awarding compensation. It has to be one of the two cases. Otherwise, fighting in court just I mean, it just seems like an extremely tedious process, which I would not go through unless somebody were, were to pay me a really big amount, you know. So that's that's one thought that occurred to me. The other thing that occurred to me when you mentioned that people actually have a special emotional attachment to their land, and that's so true, you know. As somebody who has been studying household financial portfolios in India, uh, I keep repeating, the average Indian household portfolio has... 70% land concentration in it, which means that most Indians have more than half their savings actually invested in land. And uh, there is a report which has been written by uh, an RBI constituted household committee, which calls this the tangibility bias, that even if your gains from you know other asset classes such as equity, etc., are much higher, people somehow find much more um, of a status uh, uh, or even, con- uh, you know, emotional attachment towards tangible assets such as land and property, even if the returns are uh, just not uh, adequate or comparatively lesser than the other asset classes. And this leads to a lot of irrational behavior, particularly in developing markets where, you know, the other asset classes markets are not as well developed, etc. But I don't want to, I, I'm sorry about digressing. The other thing you mentioned is executive discretion, right? And the question is that uh, if this has persistently been the case, even under the old law, the 1894 Land Acquisition Act, and in 2021, we are talking about this, why hasn't this been fixed? I mean, how have the laws evolved over time to address this question of, uh, you know, land acquisition disputes? Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll start with the tangibility bias point. I mean, that's really true. In India, we think of uh, land as being a very good social security. And, you know, um, I think most of us, when we start earning, you know, within a few years, our families will start asking, have you bought a flat? Have you bought a plot? You know, that we consider that to be the most secure investment. So, of course, when you uh, compulsively acquire Uh, that asset, uh, there is going to be resistance and the law has to account for that and compensate you adequately. So yeah, that tangibility bias is very real in India. Secondly, moving to, you know, that people are choosing to litigate, even though, uh, you know, uh, courts take very long and you know, they are spending on lawyers and there are transaction costs. So, I mean, land acquisition cases, at least uh, in the two states that we examine, take a long time. For example, uh, if you uh, if you take the case itself and the execution proceedings in a district like Bede in Maharashtra, our research showed that it takes nearly eight years. So people are willing to wait that long pay the lawyer in the meantime, there may be other expenses in terms of transport costs to the court, they're willing to spend that kind of money, because they are reasonably certain that at the end of it, their compensation is going to be enhanced. So, uh, I mean, it points to like huge flaws at the collector level when it comes to computation of uh, compensation. So, Yeah, executive discretion is a big problem. And uh, so this was a big problem under the 1894 Act, you know. There were problems with computation. Also, things like public purpose and urgency weren't really defined and were kept really broad. So people would also uh, litigate over those. I mean, is the position for a public purpose? And But in those cases, though, the court would generally favor the state because, you know, the definitions were not really tight and there was a lot of room for interpretation. Most of the decisions would be in favor of the state. Those have been uh, corrected under the 2013 Act. 
So now public purpose is defined, urgency is defined. There isn't that much scope for litigating under those. But uh, there are certain other new requirements under the 2013 Act, for example, uh, rehabilitation and resettlement and uh, social impact assessment. Now, these are again executive processes. And I mean, so far, even though it's been now, what, uh, seven, eight, eight years since the Act came into force, we are not seeing uh, the much litigation under that Act yet. But... Uh, um, I foresee that because there are these huge uh, executive processes uh, mandated under the Act, there may be uh, scope for discretion and these may get litigated. But as I said, we haven't seen evidence of it yet. Even though our, st- our study covered five years post the enactment of uh, the 2013 Act, but still most of the litigation was under the old Act. Also, under the 2013 Act, the jurisdiction of the civil courts has been ousted and an authority has been set up and all the cases are supposed to go to that authority. But we found even in 2019 in the districts that we studied that the authorities hadn't been set up. You know, when we spoke to lawyers who handle land acquisition cases, they didn't know where the authority was, you know. They didn't even know where the physical location of the authority was. So uh, we still have to see what the impact on litigation Yeah, so perhaps that could be a reason, right? If you don't know where the authority is, and even if there is a level of ignorance displayed by the lawyer who's who's the most sophisticated party in this whole transaction, uh, I can imagine people not wanting to litigate or not having uh, adequate uh, information to be able to litigate land acquisition disputes under the new act. So I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that while public purpose and a couple of other terms have been better defined under the new law, does the new law address the problem of collectors uh, determining extremely low levels of compensation? Has that sort of been addressed? Because that seems to be the major sort of ground of challenge under the old law, as per your research. There are, again, better guidelines under the new law for how to determine compensation. Plus, under the old act, uh, the compensation was the market value of the land or the property. But under the new act, uh, it is two times the market value in, in case of property in urban areas. So, I mean, the amount of compensation has gone up in that sense. So I feel that maybe the litigation may go down because uh, people may be more satisfied with this uh, larger amount of compensation. Understood. Additionally, you know, um, the the new act has provided for re, uh, resettlement and rehabilitation. So again, you can give um, alternate parcels of land or employment in the industries that are going to come up in the acquired land. So these again may satisfy the people a little more than just getting market value of the land. Understood. So this is really helpful, Leah, because most of the debates on land acquisition, at least in the press, are framed as an alternative between development versus the rights, property rights of the marginalized communities, you know, forest areas, etc. And maybe there are trade-offs always involved whenever a land acquisition, a cause of land acquisition takes place. The question is, how does the new act address these balances, address these trade-offs? So how does the new act really for example, interact with the rights of tribal uh, tribal communities or the rights granted under the Forest Rights Act or even the you know environmental impact assessment versus land acquisition for the purpose of development. How does the new act address these balances? Okay, so the new act uh, addresses these balances in quite a few ways. One is, uh, as I said, I mean, the just the amount of compensation has been increased. So even though it is a comp- still a compulsory acquisition of land, uh, the landowner and even the dependents on the land will get more money than under the old act. Secondly, in some cases, there is an element of consent. So where it is a uh, Uh, public-private partnership or the land is being acquired for a private organization, a certain percentage of the landowners have to consent to the acquisition. So in that sense, you know, the it has a compulsory nature of the acquisition has been toned down a little more. In terms of uh, acquisition of scheduled area land, I mean, there are other legislations that cover that, for example, the Panchayat Extension to Scheduled Areas Act. So, though legislation provides that the Gram Sabha and uh, or the Panchayat has to be consulted before the acquisition of land, how far this is being implemented, I'm really not sure because I haven't studied that. But yeah, there are additional uh, restrictions when it comes to acquisition of uh, 
scheduled area land. But uh, just one one other thing I want to point out is that uh, even under the new act, I mean, uh, there are certain categories of land which are acquired under other legislations, for example, the Coal Bearing Areas Act. Um, so that is still permitted. And uh, what we are observing, and because those legislations have a lower compensation or uh, they don't have provisions for resettlement and rehabilitation, some governments are still choosing to acquire under those legislations. So that is also something that needs to be accounted for. Right. So we've heard of litigants doing forum shopping now. And of course, now the government is doing land acquisition law shopping, uh, picking and choosing which land acquisition law actually works for it well. Absolutely. I wanted to go back to the point that you made about the Gram Panchayat's approval being required for acquiring land in scheduled areas adjoining villages. Now, here I'm trying to understand what are the incentives of the Gram Panchayat to make sure that the inhabitants of scheduled areas adjoining villages are compensated adequately? And how do you think that really plays out at the ground level? Is the Gram Panchayat an effective voice for the inhabitants of these scheduled areas or what do we know about this? Uh, I feel that, I mean, since they are elected representatives, uh, they are in in the best position to... uh, represent the views of the villagers or of the people whose land is being acquired. But uh, how far this is being implemented, I'm not sure. And I feel this may be a better mechanism than the social impact assessment under the 2013 Act, because uh, the body that conducts the social impact assessment is, again, members from the uh, executive. So it's not uh, experts or, you know, representatives of the people whose land is being acquired. Uh, It goes to an expert body later, but still the people conducting the social impact assessment are still belong to the executive. So I feel uh, having uh, giving the Gram Panchayat a say may be a better mechanism. Got it. So, Leah, you know, when the average person who's not familiar with land acquisition processes and law talks about land acquisition or thinks about it, the first sort of graphic image that comes to mind are the Singur protests that happened in 2008-9. And I think that's a struggle that went on for a really long time. And of course, subsequently it went to courts and uh, it's a long story that everybody uh, in India knows. But the question is, you know, of course, it led to withdrawal of investment from uh, the state of West Bengal, rightly or wrongfully. And the question is, does the law offer a solution on something like this, which is that there is indefinite stalling of land acquisition processes, uh, even if the compensation, for example, you know, were to be at market value or law uh, as per the requirements of law, and that results in deprivation of potential development that, that the state could have benefited from, potential job loss opportunities. And I wonder if the new law really addresses this. And I think you did mention uh, a project in Chennai area that managed to balance both these interests pretty well. If you could tell us a little bit about that project, that that would be helpful. Yeah, so um, I mean, in the report also, we talk about how much responsibility is on the executive to manage these processes, you know, because once things reach court, I mean, already it's too late to uh, manage the situation. But at the executive level, at at the collector level, this process can be managed much better. So uh, the Coimbedo project was a project to uh, construct a wholesale market. This was uh, envisaged to decongest the central business district of Chennai. So, um, for one thing, the process uh, was com- the process of acquisition was completed quite fast. Um, but in 28 months, the process was completed. Uh, this was under the old act, so of course, um, the compensation given was market value. But uh, the resistance and protest was less because uh, there was also uh, some rehabilitation of the affected families. They were given alternate housing, alternate plots of land, even though it wasn't mandated under that act. So that kind of, you know, um, placated some people. Uh, So the dissatisfaction in that case was much less and it didn't become uh, this a law and order situation like what happened in Singur. But even in the Coimbedu project, I would like to point out that even though, I mean, the protest and resistance was comparatively less, uh, the matter did go to court. Some of the landowners did go to court. And as we have noticed, the uh, high court increased the compensation. So, um, of course, it got stuck in the execution stage and 
uh, in 2017, I think the High Court had said that the uh, government has to pay out the execu- uh, the compensation amount. But even two years later, in 2019, people hadn't got the compensation. Got it. So I wanted to ask you that, you know, does the law secure the right to receive the compensation? So I understand that the law has made improvements on definitions of what is a public purpose on the requirement to obtain greater consensus when the land is being acquired for the purpose of a private entity, which in turn will, you know, fulfill a public purpose. I understand that the I think the new law also gives the right to compensation to people who don't have a formal title, for example. So these are great improvements. But the question is that is exactly what you brought up in the previous response in the Coimbedu project which is that, okay, the government has promised me uh, this amount. And on that basis, I've actually evicted my property. Uh, and I'm now, you know, living somewhere else. Uh, I have given up probably a livelihood that was closer to my home. Or if it was agricultural land, I've probably given up that. How does the average person who has been evicted under the Land Acquisition Act secure the right to actually receive compensation? Does the law provide anything for this? And if not, what in your experience can help people who have actually vacated their property on the promise of a compensation from the government that doesn't really come. So this is a problem of execution and this is not just in land acquisition cases. This is a problem across the spectrum in civil litigation. So even if you uh, get an order of the court in your favor, executing that order is always a challenge. And we have seen that uh, execution cases take years. So as I said, this is a problem that plagues the entire civil justice system. It's particularly acute in land acquisition cases. And um, what is strange is, as I had said, most of the land acquisition cases are about compensation. So the execution part is just payment of the money. It's not handing over of land or attachment of property, which I can imagine are more complex processes. This is just handing over money, but uh, it seems to take a long time. Some of the lawyers that we spoke to in Maharashtra said that um, execution cases are taking so long because the government just doesn't have the money to pay. And this points to a huge problem in planning. I mean, if you are planning to acquire land, then you know that X amount of compensation has to be paid. And you can also predict that some people are going to court, so X plus Y will need to be paid. So you need to have that money. It shouldn't be taking four or five years to pay out money. It points to huge problems in planning. And have you seen courts awarding exemplary damages against delays in the actual award of the compensation by the government? So uh, I haven't seen any cases of that. I mean, I don't know if they exist, but in our research, it didn't. But what's important to remember is there is interest accumulating with delay. And still, you know, the government is uh, delaying the process of payment. So uh, with every month of delay, that interest is accumulating. And still there are uh, such huge delays in payment. Yeah, that's interesting. That actually takes me back to, you know, Econ and Finance 101, which is that when we think about sovereign guarantees and the sovereign will pay, we attach a high degree of confidence in it, right? So the government of India bonds are never likely to default because the sovereign always pays. And I wonder to what extent would this continue to be true if we were to take into account delays in payment of compensation by the government or delays in payment of contractual dues by the government, you know. Uh, It's fascinating how we continue to believe that the sovereign always pays on time and the sovereign can't default despite a really uh, persistent experience of sovereign delays and defaults. Anyway, so uh, I wanted to ask you, if you you have seen the land acquisition cases under 1894, you have also seen the land acquisition related litigation under the new law. If you were to suggest some amendments that the new law could really do with to ease the process to minimize land acquisition disputes, what would those amendments be? I think the first one would be to amend the social impact assessment to include um, expert voices, to include uh, some representatives of the people whose land is being acquired. Right now, the social impact assessment is not uh, binding on the government. So maybe uh, some amendment to that to make it at least, str- even if not binding, but like strongly recommendatory. Uh, secondly, as I had said, resettlement and rehabilitation and social impact assessment are 
large processes in the hands of the executive. So uh, there need to be detailed guidelines on how the executive is to carry out these processes. Uh, right now, we are not seeing a huge amount of litigation over this, but I think uh, there is a possibility of uh, litigation on these processes. The other thing is, um, so as I had said, I mean, uh, with with regard to central laws, uh, there is there are I think sixteen laws uh, relating to land acquisition which are still valid, and uh, go- the government can acquire land under those. Uh, but uh, once the two thousand thirteen Act came into force, the state laws were overridden. But we are see still seeing that uh, state governments are acquiring under those laws because again they can pay less compensation. And uh, I think the Madras High Court has come down quite strongly against it. But I mean, the state governments have to stop doing that. You know, that is something that uh, needs to really stop because uh, either they uh, pass new laws or uh, but the old laws are definitely not applicable anymore. So, And in addition to all of these, of course, set up the land acquisition uh, tribunals, right, with under the new law. Absolutely. Those authorities. I mean, we were actually shocked when we started doing this uh, research in 2019 and we called lawyers and, and I was like, so where is the authority? And he said, I have no idea. And I was like, my God, you do these cases. You don't even know the location of the authority. And we are seeing uh, in our data that uh, even five years after the new law was enacted, cases under the new law are still being filed in the uh, civil court. It's also a mystery to me why the civil court is admitting these cases. Yeah, it seems to me that the judge should be more than happy to say, no longer my job, you know, go find the right authority. Yes, not in my backyard. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, Leah, as you know, you know, the goal of this podcast is how do you secure property rights for the land of a billion that is India? And if you had to pick one core challenge that we all should put our weight behind uh, to secure land rights for a billion people in India, what would that core challenge be? So, um, I mean, as I said, most of my work is around land acquisition. So I'm not an expert in the other facets. But I think, um, I mean, with this, since we have a new regime, we have a new Land Acquisition Act, it's really important not to make the mistakes that we made under the old act. And, uh, you know, the research that we have done, the research that uh, Namita Wahi has done, uh, all show that, you know, executive discretion was the main problem. So uh, I think state governments need to really put their minds to this, you know, and curtail this executive discretion as far as possible, give guidelines so that, uh, you know, you give as little scope for litigation as possible. So Karnataka has a litigation policy under which, you know, every department is supposed to have a nodal officer, something like that, you know, so you have a person at that, at the department level to monitor uh, the process to ensure that there's as little litigation as possible. Thanks, Leah. This has been a great conversation. Uh, Thanks for coming on this podcast. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to our podcast, Land of a Billion, produced in association with the Property Rights Research Consortium. Don't forget to catch new episodes every alternate Friday, where I will bring you a rundown on the latest charcha around land and housing in India. Thanks for listening. Log on to the Quince website and check out our other podcasts. 